Hey everyone, it is time to recap 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 to Hebrews chapter 4. If you don't know, my name is Corey. I work with Bible Discovery and Bible Discovery TV, and we are reading through the Bible this year. And this is the chapter by chapter recap. It, you know, if you're going through in the reading program and you get left behind, I'm your girl. I'm here. I'm getting you caught back up. Okay. Second Thessalonians. So just a note on Second Thessalonians. Obviously, we did First Thessalonians last weekend. So if you missed that, you can check that out. Uh, but it's believed that Second Thessalonians was actually written really close to uh, the time period that First Thessalonians was written, and um, that Second Thessalonians is a response uh, from a report from Thessalonica back to the Apostle Paul. So. 2 Thessalonians deals with three main issues. First, the persecution of the church in Thessalonica. Uh, you know, they're commended for enduring persecution. We've heard about their persecution and what's going on in 1 Thessalonians, but now, you know, they're commended. You are enduring through it. Um, number two, it deals with this false claim that some teachers were saying that Jesus had already returned. Christ had already returned to earth. So that uh, false claim is dealt with. And the third issue is idle church members. There's some church members not doing much and it's not going well. So let's just jump right in. Second Thessalonians chapter one. We learn that this letter is written from Paul, Silas, and Timothy to the Christians living in Thessalonica. So the Thessalonians. Um, in chapter one, their perseverance and faith through trials and persecutions, uh, Paul, Silas, and Timothy are encouraging there, saying, you know, your faithfulness through these trials, it's known throughout churches in many different regions. And, um, you know, people are praying for you and people are thankful for your witness to the gospel. There's also a reminder to the Thessalonians in that th about Christ's return, that there is hope in the return of Christ. Now, a quick example is verses 6 and 7, and I'm just going to read them to you. It says this, God is just. He will pay back trouble to those who trouble you and give relief to you who are troubled and to us as well. This will happen when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven in blazing fire with his powerful angels. So it's just this encouragement that this world is not all that there is, and justice will happen it will be given but ultimate justice not human justice we can't get you know no matter how many court systems we have or or whatever we use for justice here on earth we can't really fully get justice god is the only one who can do that all right we're also told uh that paul timothy and silas are praying for the Thess thessalonians specifically that god would make them worthy of his calling and that he may bring uh, to fruition every desire for goodness and every one of their deeds prompted by faith so that the name of Jesus may be glorified in them and that they may be glorified in Jesus. So the perspective here, when you listen to the prayer, it's not get me out of this suffering. It, it, it's not, it's not that, but that, that, the fruition, this desire for good things that they have would be fulfilled and that every deed prompted by faith comes to reality for this mutual, for, for the glorification of Christ and then the eternal life in Christ that they will receive. Okay, Second Thessalonians chapter 2. This is where they start dealing with the false teaching that Jesus Christ had already come back that he had already returned. So it begins by saying, don't be troubled by reports that you're hearing that Jesus Christ has already returned and that you've somehow missed it, right? So he, Paul goes on to lay out some of the key elements of what will lead up to the return of Christ. So the day will not come until the rebellion occurs and the man of lawlessness is revealed. Uh, this man of lawlessness will set himself up in God's temple and proclaim to be God himself. Um, and Paul says, you know, yes, the power of lawlessness is already at work in the world. So you can see it around us, uh, but it is currently being restrained. And when that restraint is removed, the lawlessness, the lawless one will be revealed. The lawless one will use signs and wonders to convince people, um, but he will ultimately be destroyed by Jesus. So 
I know for some of you this may be really tantalizing and you may want me to go into the details, but it is just the recap. We don't have too, too much time to delve into that, but it is interesting, isn't it? But nevertheless, Paul is using this to encourage the Thessalonians who are going through struggles. Now imagine you're going through struggles and you're having hope in you know, the the return of Christ and that one day, whether here on earth or uh, in heaven, you're going to be saved. And then people are coming along and going, well, actually, Jesus already came back. So they're, they're taking a swipe at your hope. They're taking a swipe at your faith. So this chapter ends with this from Paul, Silas, and Timothy. Stand firm and hold fast to the teachings we passed on to you, whether by word or mouth or by letter. In other words, don't be bothered by these so-called end times reports. Don't be bothered of, of, about them. You just keep living your life for Jesus. <clears throat> Second Thessalonians chapter 3. Uh, Paul, Silas, and Timothy ask for prayer for them so that the gospel can spread rapidly and be honored. Then there's this warning against idleness. Remember that third issue is there's church members being idle. And I wanted just to read it to you. <clears throat> Keep away from every believer who is idle and disruptive and does not live according to the teaching you received from us. For you yourselves know how you ought to follow our example. We were not idle when we were with you, nor did we eat anyone's food without paying for it. On the contrary, we worked day and night laboring and toiling so that we would not be a burden to any of you. We did this not because we do not have the right to such help, but in order to offer ourselves as a model for you to imitate. For even when we were with you, we gave you this rule, the one who is unwilling to work shall not eat. We hear that some among you are idle and disruptive. They are not busy, they are busy bodies. Such people we command and urge in the Lord Jesus Christ to settle down and eat the food they, and earn the food they eat. And as for you, brothers and sisters, Never tire of doing what is good. So in other words, help those, never tire of doing what's good, help those who truly need help. But also you need to encourage people to actually work for a living and to, to, to get involved with life and, and, and earn their keep, essentially. So this is not for people who cannot work in terms of disability or, or you know sickness and things like that. But people who can work and are choosing not to work and taking advantage of the church in this way and then causing all sorts of trouble, this was apparently going on in Thessalonica, so they had to deal with it here. All right, that brings us to 1 Timothy. <clears throat> now, 1 Timothy is a different letter because it's written, obviously, to an individual, to Timothy, from Paul to Timothy, but it also was meant to be read to the church at Ephesus, which we, we kind of see in the end of 2 Timothy, but... Anyways, let's jump in. This is still a personal letter from Paul to Timothy. So Paul has left Timothy, 1 Timothy 1, Paul has left Timothy in the city of Ephesus to correct uh, false teaching that's going on in the Ephesian church. So false doctrines, myths that people are devoting themselves to, and endless genealogies. We're going to hear a lot about this in the Pauline epistles and the letters of Paul. So this is something that is was going on in the first century church. These kinds of issues, myths that people were devoting themselves to, and endless genealogies and false doctrines. So Paul says, such things promote controversial speculation rather than advancing God's work, which is by faith. So in other words, people, Christians, are getting distracted from the gospel. They're getting off on all of these side issues and making things that aren't really all that important, the main focus of their faith of Christianity. So this is a problem. And, you know, this is still a problem today. We take these fringe issues and make them the main issues. And we can't afford to do that. It's a distraction from the gospel. So a, a lot of these have to do with the law as ex a lot of these um, false doctrines that were popping up in the first century church had to do with the law as expressed in the Old Testament, so the law of God, because Paul goes on to say things like these people 
want to be teachers of the law, but they don't know what they're talking about. And we know that the law is good if one uses it properly. So it has to do with the Old Testament law, which is not entirely surprising because we know, you know, from some of the other letters of Paul and from the book of Acts that the Gentile Christian issue was a big one in the Jewish Christian church. You know, do Gentiles have to live like Jews in order to be Christians? So there's all sorts of doctrines other than that popping up around this same issue. Okay. Paul then goes on to say he's thankful for God's grace to him because he himself was once a false teacher. He calls himself a blasphemer, a persecutor, and a violent man. But innocently, like he did not know that he was doing these things. He thought that he was serving God until God interrupted him. And so... He says that Timothy is charged with this important task of interrupting these false teachers and false teachings to expose them as false, to show them, no, this is actually not the way of the gospel. Interrupt those false teachings and false teachers. 1 Timothy chapter 2, Timothy is commanded to pray for all people, even for kings and those in authority. Why? So that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. He says, this is good and pleases God who wants all people to be saved. So that's the key there. This is good and pleases God who wants all people to be saved. So that's the motivation. God wants all people to be saved. So we should pray for all people and for kings and those in authority so that we may leave lead peaceful and quiet lives, not creating crazy social unrest for the wrong reasons, not going to jail and things like that if we don't have to, but being able to preach the gospel and model the transformation that Jesus Christ has in our lives, giving God, you know, good ambassadors, essentially. Therefore, in 1 Timothy chapter 2, it continues, Men, Paul wants men to pray, lifting up holy hands without anger or dispute. And he wants women to dress modestly with decency and propriety, adorning themselves, not with elaborate hairstyles or gold or pearls or expensive clothes, but with good deeds. Okay, does this mean that it's evil for men to get angry or men to debate or dispute? Not necessarily. Does this mean that it's evil for women to wear nice clothes or wear jewelry or get their hair done? Not necessarily. What is Paul saying here? Well, in the ancient world, we know that men tended to create reputations for themselves and respect through debate and through argumentation and through grandstanding. And Paul's saying, don't do this. Instead, Christian men pray, lifting up holy hands, so innocent hands set apart to God without anger and disputing. And also in the ancient world, women tended to show their cultural position, their wealth, their importance to society by adorning themselves, um, dressing really nice with expensive clothes and, and, and ornamenting themselves. And Paul's going, let's switch the script here. You need to be a higher class of woman internally, not externally. The external doesn't matter. The internal is what matters. Switch switch the script. Pray without argumentation and be of a higher class internally. All right. Verse 11 says this. And we're going to delve into some hot water here. Uh, A woman should learn in quietness and full submission. I do not permit a woman to teach or assume authority over a man. She must be quiet. Now, most of us in our Western culture today, when we get to this verse, it is very cringy because it does not jive. In fact, it's kind of insulting to our modern ideals of equality. But I do believe that's because we're reading it from a 21st century viewpoint rather than from a first century viewpoint, you know, from which it was written. And it was written to people in the first century as well. So a few things here. We often focus on the quietness and submission element of this. A woman should learn in quietness and full submission. But it's culturally backwards that Paul is commanding women 
to learn as disciples, right? A woman should learn in quietness and full submission. But all Christians are to strive towards quietness and living in submission not only to human rulers and authorities, but also to God. So women disciples also. So this is including Christian women into the discipleship program of Jesus, which was unusual for a religion of the day uh, without going into like some of the weird cults that had women as their priests. Generally in the society, women were seen, you know, as more uneducated because there wasn't oppor- many opportunities for women to be educated, just depended on who your family was. But here, a woman should learn in quietness and full submission. So uh, this is another interesting thing to, to bring up uh, here is that Paul brought this up at all because surely men in worship services were also expected to learn in a non-disruptive way like I don't think that we could imagine just men in like in a Christian worship service being super disruptive and yelling and and all that and it being okay we know that that wasn't the case right Paul's just said I want men everywhere to pray lifting up holy hands without argumentation so um I think that's just an interesting thing to bring up. Another thing, the word here to teach, where Paul goes into, I do not permit a woman to teach or assume authority over the man. For sure, the word teach and assume authority over here in Greek, many scholars see these as being one word. So it's like authoritative teaching. So most of the Christian church today, and and I think throughout time, has, I I need to study it more, but as I understand throughout time, has understood this as meaning women should not take the role of elder overseer in the church. Because we know elsewhere, for example, in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, Paul talks about women praying and prophesying publicly in the Christian worship services. And we also know there are examples of women teaching men in the New Testament. For example, Priscilla and Aquila, this couple, Priscilla is credited along with her husband Aquila with um, teaching the man Apollos, the, the man who would become a great teacher himself, teaching him, instructing him in the way of Jesus. So that's back in the New Testament book of Acts. So this isn't a full scale prescription like women cannot do anything teaching in the church. This is not what this is. It appears to be this this teaching and having authority over. So being an elder overseer of the church. Now there are a ton of interpretations of this. I am not claiming not claiming to have the perfect answer here, but just a few things to think about. Okay, so also a couple questions here that I found helpful. Uh, Due to the command for women to learn, okay, we have to keep in mind here the context is Paul wants women to learn. Were the Ephesian women getting distracted during church services and focusing on things like meal prep or fo- or friendly discussions and not learning? Were they neglecting the discipleship aspect of their church services? Because remember, they were having church services in their homes. It's possible because Paul here commands women to learn in quietness and full submission. So was, was their attitude being disruptive by not actually paying attention and learning? It's just a question. Um, And and also with the submission and authoritative teaching over a man, in Ephesus, was this a problem? Were Ephesian wives challenging their husbands about the scriptures during worship services, perhaps even unsaved wives? We don't know. A lot of people think that there was a specific situation going on here in Ephesus, potentially related to the cult of Diana that involved women in the higher up leadership of of that city uh, and the religious the religions of that city we just don't know but it is a lot of people believe that there is a cultural context going on here because Paul is specifically writing to Timothy so just things to think about here I don't claim to have perfect understanding on this but just some thoughts okay first Timothy chapter 3 moves into the qualifications for overseers and deacons. So that elder overseer, which in most churches, or I shouldn't say most, in many 
um, Protestant Christian churches today would be the senior pastor and then deacons. Okay, so the qualifications for an overseer, being above reproach, faithful to his wife, temperate, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not given to drunkenness, not violent, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money, and managing his family well, etc., etc. There's there's a lot more. For deacons, they must be worthy of respect and sincere, not indulging in much wine, not pursuing dishonest gain. They must keep hold of the deep truths of the faith with a clear conscience. In the same way, the women are to be worthy of respect, not malicious talkers, but temperate and trustworthy in everything. All right, 1 Timothy chapter 4. This is about the false teachings that are going on in Ephesus. It gives some characteristics of them. For example, forbidding people to marry and abstaining from certain foods. Um, Now, Paul goes on to give instructions to Timothy of how and why to stay true to his calling, his original calling. And verse 7 of 1 Timothy 4 says this, Have nothing to do with godless myths and old wives' tales. Rather, train yourself to be godly. For physical training is of some value, but godliness has value for all things, holding promise for both the present life and the life to come. 1 Timothy chapter 5, how to treat people in the church. And the short answer to this is like family. So if an older man was in error, you would exhort him like a father rather than rebuking him harshly. So treat him with respect still as a father. Uh, Younger men treat them like brothers. So Uh, Not with a rivalry or anything like that, but with their best interests in mind. Treat older women like mothers, so with respect and love. And treat younger women as sisters, so again, with respect, with propriety, looking out for their future, uh, not using them, right? Uh, Also, there's uh, some instructions on how to treat widows in the church here. Basically, if they need help, help them. And then families, if there's a widow, if you're related to a widow, it's your responsibility to help her. Uh, Families need to provide for one another. So we have to remember in the first century world, it wasn't like today where women could just get a job. That's not how it worked in, in the first century world. So... In order to stop a woman from becoming a beggar or destitute or having to sell herself into slavery or something like that, um, families would need to provide for her. And if she didn't have a family, then the church could provide for her. And this is assuming, of course, that she did not get remarried after her husband's death because she stayed a widow. Okay, Uh, Timothy is also told to take care of the elder overseer of the church, of the churches who live well. So take care of those, like, honor elder overseers who do well, but rebuke before the whole church those who are sinning, like continuous sin. So basically there's this public life, public responsibilities, public correction. Uh, And of course this isn't, this wouldn't be for the show, it would literally be for correction. Okay, 1 Timothy chapter 6. This is about Christian, uh, Paul goes on with looking at the different aspects of life in first century Christianity. And he talks about Christian slaves who are involved in, you know, the Roman Empire's system of slavery. He tells them to work well for their masters so that Christ may be honored. So again, this is very countercultural to us today. I think a lot because we have a different view of slavery today because of our recent history versus what the Roman Empire had going on. I'm not trying to say slavery was a good thing. It definitely was not a good thing, but it was different than what we associate with it today. Um, So in, in this situation, if you found yourself a Christian and you were a slave, you were commanded to work well for your master so that... Christ may be honored. And this didn't mean you had to stay in slavery. Paul talks elsewhere about trying to secure your your freedom. That was that was a good thing. Okay. Uh, also in 1 Timothy chapter 6, 
uh, Paul talks about the motivations of the false teachers in Ephesus, which he believed was financial gain, greediness. So this is where that verse comes into. It's a very famous verse. Godliness with contentment is great gain. So they're looking for financial gain, but you should not be looking at that. You should be looking for godliness with contentment because that is great gain. You're not constantly striving for more, more, more. There's this final passionate charge to Timothy to live well. And there's even a really interesting note to wealthy Christians about the attitudes that they're supposed to take. Uh, and spoiler alert, it's about being rich in good works. Remember how he already talked to, you know, women don't be beautiful outwardly, but be beautiful inwardly. He's saying you might be rich outwardly, but it's it's of the utmost importance that you are rich inwardly. You are rich with good works. Okay. Second Timothy. We're moving on to the second letter. Just pushing through all these books of the New Testament. Second Timothy chapter one. So Paul to Timothy, likely writing in his second Roman imprisonment that ended with his martyrdom. Paul died in this Roman imprisonment. Uh, so Paul traces Timothy's faith, which is really cool. We get a little window into Timothy's family. He traces Timothy's faith to his mother and grandmother, Lois and Eunice. There is a call for Timothy to remain loyal to both the gospel and Paul. Uh, so listen to this verse. For the spirit of God gave uh, the spirit, sorry, for the spirit God gave us does not make us timid, but gives us power, love, and self-discipline. So do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord or of me, his prisoner, Rather, join me in suffering for the gospel and the power of God. Okay, Paul has lost some Christian support because of this final Roman imprisonment. Um, we're not sure all of the details of that, but we know that some Christians have just been like, that's Paul, you know? There he is, that's Paul. They have abandoned Paul in his Roman imprisonment. So Paul just saying, don't do that. Don't abandon me in this suffering. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, uh, Paul encourages Timothy and Christians to live strongly as Christians for Christ despite outside pressure. He uses soldier imagery, the imagery of uh, a runner running a race, and a farmer faithfully farming. Uh, Paul goes on to say, you know, I might be chained, but the word of God is not changed. Uh, he emphasizes remembering Christ and remembering Jesus's work for us and his suffering for us and how that will strengthen us enough that if we have to suffer for Christ, we will get through it. So remember Christ. He warns Christians again against quarreling over words, over just meaningless arguments. It ruins those who listen. Paul says it ruins those who listen. So when you're talking to each other about these issues, remember that there are people listening. Remember that you are a witness. So don't ruin the witness of Christ for arguments that don't mean anything. Okay, uh, he encourages Timothy to correctly handle the word of truth. So the word of God and the gospel, correctly handle it. Be very careful how we treat the Bible. We learned that some false teachers were teaching that the resurrection of the dead had already happened. So perhaps they're saying that the resurrection of the dead is spiritual. So when Christ comes into your heart, you rise from the dead, right? Or perhaps they're confining it to that Matthew chapter 27 event. So after Jesus rises, some of the righteous, in, some of the righteous dead come out of their tombs and start... Uh, uh, witnessing to people after the resurrection of Christ. Uh, so we don't know exactly how they were teaching it, but we know that some false teachers were teaching that the resurrection had already happened. Uh, verses 22 to 26 say this, Flee the evil desires of youth and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace, along with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. Don't have anything to do with foolish and stupid arguments because you know they produce quarrels. And the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but must be kind to everyone, able to teach, not resentful. Opponents must be gently instructed in the hope that God will grant them repentance, 
leading them to a knowledge of the truth and that they will come to their senses and escape from the trap of the devil who has taken them captive to do his will. So in other words, change your mindset. Uh, Be kind to everyone and be able to teach rather than just quarrel about stuff and and be gentle with your opponents, uh, not seeing them as enemies, but hoping all the while that God will bring them to repentance, right? So this is a total mind switch. This is not normal. This is not our normal human condition, right? But we need to, we need to come to God's condition, not just stay with our own. 2 Timothy chapter 3, Paul talks about how morality will continue to decline in the world and he gives examples of it, uh, which are really depressing. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to parents. It's a really interesting list. And he says, but you, however, continue in the faith despite persecution, which will come. And he encourages them, you know, know the scriptures that are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ. This is also where that really cool verse comes from. If you've been a Christian for a while and gone to church, you have probably heard it. All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. That comes from here in 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 4, this is a charge to Timothy. Preach the word. Be prepared in season and out of season. Correct, rebuke, encourage with great patience and careful instruction. Uh, Paul believes also in this chapter, he lets, he lets Timothy know that he believes that he is close to death. He doesn't think that he's going to get out of this imprisonment. He says things like, I fought the good fight. I finished the race. I have kept the faith. So I imagine for Timothy, who had traveled with Paul and called Paul his spiritual father, because it appears that Timothy's father was not a Christian, his biological father. So he sees Paul as his spiritual father. That this would have been difficult for him to read. Uh, Paul wants Timothy to try to come to him quickly, and he asks him to bring Mark, John Mark. So apparently they've patched up that disagreement that they had back in Acts. Um, And he asks for Timothy to bring him his cloak, because winter is coming, and also to bring him his scrolls and parchments. There's some interesting personal remarks and travel notes and greetings also to wrap up this chapter. Okay, Titus. Uh, The book of Titus, this is a letter from Paul to Titus, who is a leader and teacher who Paul had left on the island of Crete to finish the work of establishing the church there on Crete and setting up the church leadership so that it would be self-sustaining and fully functioning. So Paul goes over the qualifications for an elder again, and he adds, he must hold firmly to the trustworthy message as it has been taught so that he can encourage others by sound doctrine and refute those who oppose it, who oppose sound doctrine. That's verse nine. Okay, so we learned that in Crete, there are people who are disrupting the church by false teaching based off of the Bible, but messed up, uh, also based off of human thoughts and myths, etc. So it sounds similar to what's going on in Ephesus, if not exactly the same. So Titus chapter two, Paul encourages Titus to teach the older men, the older women, the younger women, and the younger men, uh, they all have slightly different and specific things, but they all involve the magical word, self-control. It's not really magical. No one really likes it. Who likes developing self-control? It's really difficult, right? But self-control. So Paul also talks about what self-control looks like in your context, you know, by going through all of these different individuals, these different kinds of individuals, what self-control looks like in your context depends on your context. It depends on who you are, what stage of life you're in, what you do, all of these things. Paul even gives instructions for slaves again, once again, here in Titus to serve well and be fully trustworthy so that in every way they will make the teaching about God our Savior attractive. Okay, this is again not popular in our culture today because Christian living is different. Our focus becomes not on how can I make my life better, but how can I be a good witness of Christ to those around me. Titus chapter 3, Paul basically says, live life better. 
<laughs> live life better. I want to read some of it to you. Uh, Titus chapter 3, starting in verse 1. Remind the people to be subject to rulers and authorities, to be obedient, to be ready to do whatever is good, to slander no one, to be peaceable and considerate, and always to be gentle toward everyone. At one time, we too were foolish, disobedient, deceived, and enslaved by all kinds of passions and pleasures. We lived in malice and envy, being hated and hating one another. But when the kindness and love of God our Savior appeared, he saved us not because of righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy. And then I'm going to skip down to verse 9. And I want you to stress these things so that those who have trusted in God may be careful to devote themselves to doing what is good. These things are excellent and profitable for everybody. But avoid foolish controversies and genealogies and arguments and quarrels about the law because these are unprofitable and useless. Warn a divisive person once and then warn them a second time. After that, have nothing to do with them. You may be sure that such people are warped and sinful. They are self-condemned. So again, the Christian mindset has to be different than the worldly mindset. We have to be focused on being a compassionate witness to those around us and yet being bold and, and not afraid to live our lives for Jesus Christ and tell the truth when we're asked. Okay, next we are moving on to the book of Philemon. It's just one chapter. It's a tiny letter from Paul to Philemon, uh, but also to Aphia and Archippus and the church that's in their home. So basically, in this short letter, Paul has let Philemon's uh, servant, he's met Philemon's servant while Paul is in prison. And this servant, whose name is Onesimus, has become a Christian under Paul's tutelage and now is going back to Philemon for forgiveness and restoration of the relationship. Uh, and Paul is endorsing Onesimus and basically telling uh, Philemon that he needs to forgive him and accept him back as a Christian brother. Uh, so uh, we're not exactly sure what the situation is is that Onesimus needs forgiveness and to go back to Philemon. Uh, either Onesimus was a runaway slave, he ran away from his post, or, and just kind of ran into Paul, or he somehow mistreated or wronged Philemon and then he ran to Paul because he saw Paul as an authority figure over Philemon. He ran to Paul for help, for intercession in the relationship because otherwise he knew he was toast, right? So, uh, regardless of what this situation started out as, what this letter shows us is that Christianity can really overcome any barrier, that the forgiveness of Christ that we pass on to others can, can cross any barrier. And here, an offense like this involving a slave wronging his master or running away from his master, this certainly would have been seen as an unforgivable offense within their society. So by allowing the love of Christ to cover this sin and allow for forgiveness here of whatever this sin was, they're being a testimony to the culture around them that Christ is real and his work is real. Okay, we're just going to do, I know this is a long one, we're just going to do the first four chapters of Hebrews and that will finish our week. <clears throat> Hebrews chapter one. The book opens with, in the past God spoke to us through prophets, but now God has spoken to us through his son, Jesus Christ. So the prophets and then Jesus are kind of compared and contrasted here. Uh, the book's going to go on to emphasize the central role of Jesus and how we need to stay faithful to him above all other things. So basically Jesus is higher than or more important than everything else. And Hebrews 1 begins with he's higher and more important than the angels. Okay, so Hebrews chapter 2 talks about how we must be careful not to drift away from the gospel so that it is possible to drift away and it's dangerous to drift away from the gospel. Hebrews 2 also talks about how Jesus Jesus was fully human so that he could fully redeem us 
as humans. So verses 16 to 18 says this, For surely it is not angels he helps, but Abraham's descendants. For this reason he had to be made like them, fully human in every way, in order that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in service to God, and that he might make atonement for the sins of the people. Because he himself suffered when he was tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. So just talking about that plan that God had, that perfect plan in having Jesus become fully human and experience what we experience and being able to redeem us through his sacrifice. Hebrews chapter 3, this is about how Jesus is greater than Moses. Not that Moses is bad, not that angels are bad, but that Uh, You know, it talks about how Moses was like a servant in God's house, but Christ is the faithful son who is over God's house, who gives those commands, right? Um, It implores people, don't let your hearts be hardened by sin, but come to God. Come to God. Don't let your hearts be hardened by sin. Verses 12 to 14 say this. See to it, brothers and sisters, that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God. But encourage one another daily, as long as it is called today, so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. We have come to share in Christ, if indeed we hold our original conviction firmly to the very end. Don't drift. Hold your conviction of Jesus as the Christ firmly to the end. Jesus must be central to our faith or it is no faith at all. Hebrews chapter 4. Our last chapter for today, salvation through Christ is compared to a Sabbath day rest. That is, there's, it's kind of twofold here. We will enter into a Sabbath rest at the fulfillment of our faith. So when Christ comes back or when we die, but also when we come to Christ in this life, We have rest from our own works. We're not incessantly trying to earn our salvation, but instead we rest in Jesus Christ's righteousness for our eternal life. We are trusting in him for our salvation. There's a very famous verse 12, Hebrews 4 verse 12, for the word of God is active, alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. And verse 13 should be just as famous, I think. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. All right, uh, Hebrews chapter 4 goes on to talk about how Jesus is our great high priest. He can empathize with us. Uh, so he's He's made atonement for us. He's made a way for us. He is the go-between for us. Uh, and he can empathize with us. So he's just this perfect high priest. And then it says this, Let us then, having Christ as our high priest, let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. So through Christ, let's go to God in prayer all the time so that he can give us his grace to help us in our time of need. All right, guys, that was a long one today. It was a big one. Second Thessalonians chapter one to Hebrews four. If you have any questions or comments, I know I just had to do a brief summary of everything. There were so many issues in there that are hot button issues like women in ministry, like the end times, like Jesus's role as the high priest that I would love to talk about. Uh, but perhaps in another video. Let me know your comments and questions and how you're doing on the reading and if any of these areas of scripture you find really encouraging or really challenging, let me know. I think it's really interesting. I love reading your comments and I hope you have a good one.